Hello out there in chameleon land. This is your host, Bill Strand. And today we're going to be talking about whether breeding has anything to do with the wild caught imports. You hear the common refrain, I want to breed chameleons so we don't have to take them out of the wild. What's the truth behind that statement? Unfortunately, it's a very easy answer. The breeding we do here in the United States, in Europe, any place outside of the chameleon's natural habitat has almost zero effect on the import-export situation. Now, I don't want that to be discouraging, but it is important that we understand how the world dynamics work. So I'll start at the beginning. There was a time where you could take as many animals out of the wild as you wanted. There was no legal oversight. You just did it. And thousands upon thousands of chameleons and reptiles and other animals were shipped out until people said, wait a minute, this is not good. There's got to be some sort of uh, uh, intelligence behind how we do this or else we're just going to strip our natural resources. So a number of countries got together and they created the organization called CITES. That's the Convention for the International Trade of Endangered Species. This is a group that's based in Switzerland and countries sign on and they say we are going to adhere to the standards set by CITES. CITES takes scientific population data. They compare that with biological data and they come up with a number of, say, panther chameleons that are able to be exported and put into the pet trade so it will not adversely affect the population. And so if everything is working perfectly, under the CITES quotas, as long as, say, Madagascar ships out only 2,000 panther chameleons a year, the population will not be threatened. And this is good. Because when a country has a monetary value on a species, then they tend to value that species. If people can make money by collecting panther chameleons, then they're doing that instead of burning the forest down for charcoal. Now, it's a, definitely a complicated situation, but if we adhere to the CITES quotas, the pet trade is not a threat to the wild population. There are a number of caveats and weak points in that argument, but right now it's a fairly effective method for regulating how many animals come out of the wild. One weakness is that not all the countries in the world have agreed to the CITES convention. Another weakness is that CITES is only works at the species level. Now, we know that chameleons at the subspecies level are very different, like Jackson's chameleon, the Xanthalophus, who lives on Mount Kenya, and the Machacos Hills variety that lives in, well, the Machacos Hills. They are the same species, according to our convention right now, but we know that they are two totally different populations. And so if they make decisions based on Jackson's chameleon data, a certain locale could easily be stripped clean while still adhering to the CITES quotas. This is an issue, and this is why it's important for scientists to work on those species designations. It's so those chameleons can get the right protection. So you can see there's a whole lot of complications that surround this whole topic. But as far as we're concerned, as long as the United States is following the CITES quotas, we can be comfortable that we are being the most responsible that is possible. Now, someone may say, well, why don't you just leave them all in the wild? And the problem is that only works if the wild isn't disappearing. Right now, those forests are burning. They are sliding into the ocean. The home of the chameleons is disappearing. So stopping the pet trade is not going to stop the slow slide into extinction. Those efforts would be effective in countries that don't adhere to the CITES convention. Those efforts would be even more effective if they were put towards conserving the environment so the chameleons don't burn on the trees. They need to have a home if we're going to keep them alive in their home. So anyway, back to the effect of breeding on the export situation. The CITES quotas for exporting chameleons is based 100% on that scientific study as to what's sustainable. It has nothing to do with the market. It has nothing to do with market value, supply, demand. And so you could take away all the demand for a certain species of chameleon, but that chameleon would still be exported. And the reason is that all of the exporters in Madagascar, they get a certain amount of the quota. 500 panthers, 500 carpets, 500 ustaletai, and 500 varicosas. Well, 
you as an importer, if you're buying these from them, you don't get to say, okay, I only want the Panthers. They are going to say, no, this is all the chameleons and you have to take all of them because they know if they sell the Panther quota and then they sell the carpet quota that nobody is going to buy their quota for Ustaletai or Varicosis. So what they do is they tie it all together. So no matter whether there is a market for it or not, if there's a CITES quota for it, the exporters are going to be sending them over. And a very depressing truth is that a chameleon will sell no matter what. You give a low enough price and a chameleon will sell. And this is why you have chameleons that are being sold for $25. I, it's horrible. It's depressing. We don't have those species around anymore because nobody wanted to work with them. And this is where we shoot ourselves in the foot. If we see a wild caught chameleon being sold for $75, say, and then we refuse to buy captive hatched chameleons for more than that, or just a little bit more than that, then nobody is going to breed that chameleon. We have so many species that are easy to breed, but we don't have them anymore because they just came in too cheap. Trioceros montium, that two-horned chameleon from Cameroon, incredible species. The number of people today that would just give out hundreds and hundreds of dollars to be able to have a wild caught of that just so we could start breeding. But I remember when they were $35, they were throwaway species. They just came in by boatloads until the quota stopped them. But nobody worked with them seriously because the market wouldn't pay what it takes to breed them. And you can't blame breeders for not breeding something they can't sell because eventually what do you do with all the chameleons? And this is why so many chameleons are no longer in the market. We had a breeder for multituberculata. We had a breeder for daramensis. These are incredible chameleons. But why are they not around anymore? It's because it was so difficult to sell the babies. And here is where it's a real problem when there is cheap wild caught chameleons. There is a cheap wild caught chameleon, you can be sure that breeding efforts will be minimal. Or people will breed them once and say, yeah, this is great, but then why breed them again if you couldn't sell all the babies? Until they're no longer available. And then all of a sudden everybody's clamoring saying, oh, I want this species so badly. Happens time and time again. But let's take a look at that breeding situation again. What effect does a successful breeding program have on the importation of wild-caught chameleons? Well, I'll tell you what the effect is, and let's take panther chameleons. That is a perfect example. It's a real-world example. We have a lot of captive-hatched panther chameleons available. You do not need a wild-caught panther chameleon. And so what's happened is that the wild-caught panther chameleons are now coming in, but they are going to the breeders. But the people who want pets are getting their captive bred chameleons from the breeders. And this is a perfect situation because the captive bred panther chameleons are way superior as pets. I mean, leave it to the breeders to deal with the wild caught situation. They come in with parasites. They don't know about this whole cage situation. They need to be acclimated. There's, they may be cheaper. But boy, when you start taking into account how much time you got to put into them and the vet visits and the anti-parasitic medicine, uh, it's not the great cheap thing that you thought it was. But the breeder is using that as an investment and they are okay taking this panther chameleon, putting him in a cage in the back where he's not going to be bothered and giving him the privacy and, and letting him acclimate however he wants to. They're not trying to hold him. They just want him to breed. And so he gets taken care of and he lives a long life. If he was into the general market sold at uh, one of these pet stores or a pet show to a standard person who didn't know what they were doing, it would not be as good of a situation. In fact, it might be pretty bad. So having a strong breeding community has only benefited the panther chameleon species. It has had no effect as to how many are coming over, but it has had an enormous effect on how well those that do come over are treated. So don't think that you're going into breeding because you're going to be saving the wild population or that you're going to be sending chameleons back. We can't send chameleons back to their natural habitat. Number one, their natural habitat is bleeding into the ocean. And, and so we've got to save their natural habitat before we think of sending anything back. And then there's things they pick up, maybe pathogens, who knows, that we don't want to send back to the wild populations. So when they're here, they're here to stay. When they're born here, they're not going anywhere. They're here to stay. 
So we're not doing a Noah's Ark thing, at least with the thought of sending them back to their natural habitat. We are able to continue them here in the United States or Europe or wherever you are. And if something horrible happens in Madagascar and we lose the population in Madagascar, yes, the panther chameleon will continue in captivity for quite a long time because it's well established. So I know I'm batting your back and forth as to yes, no, yes, no. The bottom line is, no, we're not saving the wild population by breeding, but we are advancing our community's knowledge in how to take care of them. And we're expanding our community of people who actually experience chameleons. And there's power in that. The more people that understand chameleons and appreciate chameleons, the more of a voice chameleons, reptiles will have in legislation, in conservation, and attention to the wild populations. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. The number of people who couldn't identify where Madagascar was on a map before they got into chameleons is maybe not surprising. (laughs) But once they get into chameleons, they now know about Madagascar. Now they're interested in Madagascar. Now they're caring that the forests in Madagascar are bleeding into the ocean. Now they get involved with the conservation in Madagascar and the saving of the land in Madagascar, the, the helping of the people in Madagascar. So the love of chameleons generates an awareness of the people and environment that the chameleons come from. Our chameleons are ambassadors of their home country. And if we take our herpeticulture seriously, We help them with their mission of spreading awareness of what's going on over there. So I encourage you, enjoy your chameleon hobby. If you want to get into breeding, I encourage you to do that as well. It's a a huge undertaking, so make sure you're prepared, but it is an incredible experience. And so I think that's enough of a chameleon concept to uh, mull on today. This is Bill Strand signing off, and I will see you tomorrow.